Welcome to The Crossroads, the show where we dive into the stories of unique and accomplished individuals so that you can unlock your best life. Dylan, Aaron, thank you. Welcome to the show. Uh, Aaron just led us through a very nice stretching exercise before we got this started, so we're all fired up and ready to talk for a little bit. And the reason why I wanted to have you guys on the show today is because you both have a background in dance, and that was primarily a big part of your lives and still is. And not only that, but as we have continued down this road, you have found a way to team up and use your strengths and passions to create something. And that something is Offset Med. And it's something that I have been very enchanted by for the last few like years. Um, I think it's almost been maybe one year since I met you. Um, you were at UCBL, which is our Unified Collegiate Breaking League yes. event. And... I remember seeing you guys there um, dressed up in these all black, almost army, army military looking like uniforms. It's like, who are these guys? What's going on? Um, and they're wearing like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm remembering this correctly, but almost like some people wearing boots and you guys had your tucked in polos and you're all buff and fit. I'm like, Holy crap. These guys are awesome. I'm like, is this a crew? Do we have to battle these guys? But then you're like, Oh no, we're the good guys. We're like, we're the, we're the medics. I'm like, Oh, snap, you, don't shoot, you don't shoot the medic. And I was like, why is this not a thing before? <laughs> yeah. Don't shoot the medic. But Essentially, this is something that I think when a lot of people see you at events, at dance events, and other things is that they immediately start to wonder why this was never a thing before. So I really wanted to talk to you guys because you found a way to pro provide the community with something that it needed while at the same time um, diving deep into your strengths and finding your passions. So um, I'm going to give both of you a turn to just kind of share your story of where you guys started, where, where did your relationship with dance begin and how did it evolve into where you, what you're doing and where you are today? So let's start with uh, Aaron and then we'll go to Dylan. Mm. Oh. All right, so dance. Funny thing, when I was a kid, I was actually kind of scared to dance. I was scared of dancing as a whole because I guess, you know, mentality back in the day, you know, guys, why are you to dance? That's a, that's a girly thing to do. So that's how it kind of started. And my, my uncle did not help that situation because he was kind of, he's kind of the more wild uncle. So when he dances, it's not that cool. <laughs> so I was like, uh, maybe I shouldn't really dance. But my first introduction and where it kind of like started my interest was, uh, you know, the idea of freestyling, breaking, popping, locking, 
all those different kinds of styles that kind of go into have the ability and the capacity to be able to freely express yourself, you know, whether it be to any kind of song, any kind of time, any kind of movement. And that started in high school. And then from there, my interest slowly grew and it started with breaking because for me, I didn't visually, I didn't feel like that popping would make, I didn't feel like it resonated with me as much. So I was like, okay, it's cool, but I don't know, breaking kind of like, it's a cool thing. I was doing tricks at the time already. I was doing kind of gymnastics. So that's how it kind of started with more like power oriented, like movement. So that's where breaking kind of like started to like escalate from there. And then, you know, from there, freestyling into, uh, you know, choreography into collegiate scene and through the collegiate scene, that's where I met Aaron. And he happened to be my opposite in one, one of the formations in our like sets at the time back in 2014. And this was a Loki GRB. So I was like, it was pretty cool. Hey. So not, not too crazy now since it's been like years ago and we were only there for so long, but it was, that's how like we initially met. So from there, I think a couple of years later we had a hiatus of like just dance in general. And we were kind of like just doing our own stuff. Then three, two, three years later, Aaron comes back. He's like, Hey Dylan. I'm like, what's up? He's like, you good with tech stuff? I'm like, yeah. He's like, you want to help me do a podcast? I'm like, sure. Why not? Because I wasn't like, I was mainly kind of working at the time for like a, at a nonprofit doing some data man, database management and all that. But I was like, sure, why the hell not? It's a way to kind of like keep my free time, but also kind of help a friend who I haven't seen in a while. And that's how this journey kind of started between Excellent. us. That's yeah. awesome to hear because what happened and um, I mean, first of all, GRV is a force to be reckoned with. So the fact that when I found out you guys were on that team, I was like, yo, that's crazy. And that's a great thing to just have in your history books. And as experience, I'm sure, um, not only being part of the team, but part of something that has a foothold in the dance community. So you guys really have that background, not only as a breaker, but also choreo uh, dancers, right? To yeah. <laughs> be able to, to continue to take with you forward. And I guess the next thing I want to ask you guys about is since you both have very different backgrounds, but found your way to unite under a, a similar cause, which is that of Offset Med, um, I wanted to ask you about how did those passions or disciplines develop and where they start. So for Dylan, for example, your background is like computer science and tech. Um, and I'm curious yeah. where your interests and when you began to develop that skill set was. And for Aaron, right, is uh, physical therapy and, and athletic training. So um, I wanted to hear you guys' journeys on that and how that began to integrate within and become what it is now. I kind of start uh, for, for me, uh, my love for technology always kind of stemmed from video games because, you know, as a kid, that's what I mm. grew up, you know, playing since I was like, I remember the first game, the first like real game that I played when I was like five years old, I think. I remember my dad bringing it home. I was like, what is this? I see the Wars Rogue Squadron. So it was like the original like Star Wars like flight game. Oh. Where, like, where you pilot X Wings and all that back in the day. So back on like the old cream colored like CRT monitor computers, <laughs> right? Yeah. So that's how I kind of started with like my interest in technology and games. And then from there, I started learning more about mo mobile technology and then just other tech in general, tech trends, and then led me to computer science. And, you know, the first, every, every CS major is like, I want to, I want to be a computer science major because I like to play video games. That's usually how it starts. I can't say for everyone, but that's the majority of how it usually starts, but it eventually changes over time. So different priorities, different things. So that's where I started going towards like more the IT route because it's, I was already in it. I was doing kind of IT work at the time back in like when I was like 18. So that was quite a few years ago. I'm an old man, but, <laughs> but IT work and then it kind of transitioned into more database management. And from there, like my skill sets were fairly, you know, all right in terms of, uh, I guess, well, compared to like the idea of like, you think computer science, you go software engineer. That's the main route. But there are, of course, cyber cybersecurity, other technology, IT work, things like that in between. So I decided to go to IT since it was already available to me. But when it comes to, let's say, my journey leading up to like meeting with Aaron and doing all this stuff like for him, and like with him, it started with, so like, huh, I'm kind of bored with IT now. Like it, I've been doing this for quite some time. It's getting kind of stagnant and there's no real growth in it. And that's something that like, it's like the idea of at least within among our friends and people who were like peers with growth, constant growth every single year, every single time we're trying to grow ourselves and become better each time. Whereas for me, I didn't want to be stagnant with it. So I was like, okay, let's 
transition from that. Let's, let me see what I can do with Aaron and help him do. Maybe it'll be something great. Maybe it'll be something mediocre. You know, we'll see. Like, we don't know. So from there, like, that's when I started getting into like podcast production. So uh, more audio editing, uh, processing and all of that, figuring out different ways I can like make things transition smoother or like how to make this guy sound less ums. Right. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. So better editing technique. So I le started learning more of that and eventually like, transition into like developing his website for him or creating a website because initially we had a, we had a developer, I'm not gonna say any names, but we, he, I don't know what happened to him. He kind of just left. So I decided to just take up the reins and that's what kind of happened at my previous job too, where it's like IT work, but then web developer, he kind of left. So I had to take more responsibilities to try to figure out how to do this from the ground up without any like really baseline knowledge of web dev. So a lot of it's being is like learning like on the fly so with a website, it's, I've been like, I feel a lot more comfortable now doing it, but it was quite the process. And well, again, the struggle to like trying to figure out like, what the hell am I supposed to do? It, am I trying to, because in addition to like, just make, being able to like create a website, you need to understand basics of design, right? Because you can't just make something and have it look like crap. It has to look good. Otherwise, like if the presentation's not there, no one's gonna like go to your website. No one's gonna go to your Instagram page because your feed sucks or something like that, right? So I've um, been learning more of like the design aspects of a website, what makes a good UI versus crappy UI, things like that. So that's where my skill sets have are is slowly like evolving towards more like web dev. But I do have other like interests like in the back of my mind. So like you know, I guess not festering. Festering is kind of like a, a dark word, more like just like simmering there we go simmering that's the better word simmering like uh gotcha. you know i'm picking up my playing my keyboard or piano more often now so because uh you know why not because i have the time and just like being more creative and yeah just trying to improve myself improve myself and like make the website better and better until like we fully like relaunch it because we had an initial launch like a while ago but it wasn't running that well things were slow to load and again learning process so i'm like optimizing as i go so that's how it's kind of been for the past like few months. Oh yeah. That's super awesome to hear, man. A few things from that. Uh, the yeah. first one is I feel like the root of that and a lot of um, maybe what set these cornerstones for you was video games, right? Yeah. Um, video games can be really powerful if, if, oh, yeah. if influenced correctly, right? Because that idea of, I don't know, there's just something about games that are so satisfying and especially it for kids to play. And on top of that, just having, um, that I feel like there's a lot of parallels with breaking as well, almost where yeah. like a fighting game like, or leveling up, right. You got to acquire these skills. Like telling the story as well. Like, because we, we not only work because like with breaking, you, you usually associate like battle mentality, battling someone, you're trying to one up the other guy, you're trying to win. Right. But no one really ever takes time to kind of see what's the story behind it. What's the story of movement? Because that's where a lot of the impact comes from. Like for me, like video games, that's, like good one of the best story like narrative experiences that i can never see like and play through in a video game is the last of us like mm. for me that game is like top tier s tier if i were to say but like again that narrative the impact of the story so it's again that could be someone's background again that could be how they execute this one song over another guy which if, if I were to be honest, yeah, it's like some one choreographer might kill this song, but the other guy is kind of like, eh, it's not that cool. It's, don't vibe with it as much, you know? So again, that's the story. That's where the effect usually is. Awesome. And it's awesome to hear that you've learned that from video games as well, right? There's so many things yeah. that you've taken from that and are applying now, right? So on top of that skill on its own, just the idea of acquiring and leveling up and continuing to grow, right? That's what you mentioned mm -hmm. when you said you wanted to meet, when you met Aaron and you were like, okay, um, this seems like a new opportunity that I'm interested in and that it's a new venue that I can learn things in. And I can see that in, I mean, your room, there's a keyboard right behind you. You were talking about learning that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, just like learning how to put together a website, uh, learning how to optimize your podcast, which I do need to talk to you about. And there's a Rubik's <laughs> cube on your desk, like all these different things. Okay, um, Rubik's cube so that I still have yet to solve. I forgot all the algorithms. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> The fact that it's there says something, right? It's like a set piece. But yeah. anyway, that's that's all great to hear, and it makes sense. Um, it, it it makes it it says a lot about your personality, and I, I wanted to ask you more about that. But let's let's go to Aaron because um, yeah, yeah. I'm curious, Aaron. How how did you um, begin your interests, and what what are some things maybe that were about you that led you into 
athletic training? What, what were those notions that you took in your personality as a child? Yeah, I guess before I transition to my story, I just want to preface everything that Dylan says by saying that I am most impressed always when we started working together that Dylan was always down to do something he's never done before because he was willing to learn it. And essentially, that is kind of the story that links a lot of our lives together is that we all get a chance to try and do something new. Um, and there's very little like consequences to quote unquote failing because at the end of the day, we know that we're still going to move forward with it. So yeah, definitely. Just want to preface that. Key um, trait. Very key trait, feeling. find quality traits in your teammates. Um, yeah, I guess for myself, it was a very, um, I would say it started off as a very selfish endeavor um, as a young dancer that was, at, you know, that got injured, wanted to be back uh, performing. It was like, what is, what do I have to do to like still uh, perform my best and stay on my A game? But now I feel like I have a chip on my shoulder, meaning that like, you know, my knee doesn't feel the same like it used to be. Like I'm not quote unquote a normal person anymore. So uh, I had to kind of like strategize between like, okay, where, what do I have to do? And part of it was like, I need to learn more. I need to figure out different ways to train. I need to figure out different ways to eat, different ways to uh, improve like my mindset, my thinking, my habits, because I have this quote unquote like burden on me now. Um, and working with other healthcare providers at the time, uh, they didn't really understand what it was like for me to dance. They didn't really understand or ask me like, what are the dance styles that you do and who do you look up to? And um, you know, those things that would kind of motivate someone to, to get better. You know, I'm suffering uh, issues now with my knee because of a really poorly motivated rehab process because at the time I didn't understand the importance of it um, I didn't understand the impact, long-term impact of it. And now I have to work through it. And it's, but it's taught me a lot of things along the way. And again, we kind of talked about key qualities and key traits. And one of those traits that I learned to develop for myself and that I seek in other people is that when there's like an obstacle or, or a challenge in the way, like how do they handle that? How are they going to handle that adversity? Are they going to be resourceful? Or are they just going to uh, take the path of least resistance, right? And uh, for us, you know, we know that it's going to be an uphill battle for uh, us to kind of create this idea, culture shift, change that Offset Med is about. So we need to have this underlying grit to persevere um, because at the end of the day, this is this is everyone's uh, time. This is everyone's effort. And I don't take that lightly uh, because, you know, we're, we're all trying to work together to make something amazing happen. So, yeah. Uh, at, oh, totally went off track. Athletic training, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. No, no, keep it. Yeah, thanks. Yes, athletic training. So how, how did, I mean, you kind of already segued into it. Let's, let's, let's dive a little bit more into it. How, how did, yeah. what were the, was it a whim or was it something that was developed over time? So I, uh, during my injury, I worked with a physical therapist. She was great. Um, I remember talking to her after my whole re rehab process um, and just catching up with her when I was considering possibly pursuing PT school. Um, I was at high school. I was in high school, and there was an athletic trainer at my high school, luckily. Um, so my physical therapist told me to go follow up with the athletic trainer at the high school because my knee was still really swollen. I had just finished surgery, and I was still going to go and do PT sessions with her. So I went to the school and the athletic trainer there was like, oh, like I've never seen you before. Um, like, what do you need? And I was like, oh, I just came in to get a bag of ice for class. And he was like, why are you so shy? Like, just come <laughs> in, man. <laughs> um, and it was weird because, you know, I always thought they were too busy working with the athletes, like the people who are on the basketball team, football team, things like that. And so he talked to me and was like, oh, okay, like he just took time to get to know me. So after that, um, 
you know, I decided to continue to pick his brain and, uh, he was just like, you know, this, if you like what I do, um, you know, you can go to school for it. And I was like, what? That's super cool. And at the time when I went looking for it, I still didn't really know what it was. I mean, I'm, this is like a high schooler, you know, perspective and lens. And all you see uh, in high school is like, man, like this guy gets to, you know, drive a cart around and sit at practices and watch people play sports. And uh, he like knows about injuries and how to get people faster and healthier. It's like, this is cool. Cause I really didn't see myself, you know, working at a clinic um, cause I did my rehab at Kaiser and you know, when you're 14 years old, you're still in the same clinic with like all the, I remember I sat on the bicycle doing my rehab once and the guys that sat next to me had two knee surgeries and he was like 60, 70 something. And then he was just like, Hey, uh, you should probably move faster. And I was like, me, dang. <laughs> I was getting roasted by the <laughs> older gentleman on my right. So, yeah, it was just like an interesting environment for me to be at. And I was like, ah, okay, I, I, I want to learn more about like, you know, sports and athletics. Um, so it, it kind of taught me like you, you still need to get good at the fundamentals and basics and then you can work higher level things. And that's what I continue to enjoy was that in athletic training, you know, there's just so much exposure to all different types of movement and styles um, and people. And, uh, you know, I felt really lucky to be in places where I got to see some incredible things happen, whether it's from, you know, an immediate acute injury that happens like on the field in front of my eyes, and I can see how they got into that position, take care of that person. And then also all the way at the other end, when someone has recovered from like a year, year and a half long rehab process. And now we're testing them to see if they're sport ready and now they're killing it on the field. So, um, it was very fulfilling and, uh, the more and more I knew about it or learned about it in school, um, it just kind of fed that, uh, that hunger. So, yeah. Got it. Wow. So I didn't know that, um, in high school, you'd actually found somebody who, you know, since, whether that be formal, informal became almost like a mentor figure, right? Or someone that you could look up to and see that you're like, whoa, like this is a thing. And um, was willing to show you a little bit more, right? Like, hey, you can do this as a job. And mm -hmm. continuing to, to take that experience, go with it. And while you're in that space, evaluating it, seeing what there is about these current institutions and how that contrasts with what you want to see more of in the future. And thus yeah. finding a way to pave your own path, right? And that's kind of one of the keys, right, of Offset Med is, is finding something that ha doesn't already, that isn't very prevalent right now, right? There's not very much athletic training or movement therapy for these dancers, for breakers, and for, for urban artists, right? Exactly, for art dancers. Touching on that, right? What made you really feel like this needed to be a thing and, and, and the types of reflections that you went through in order to take action and build offset. And let's start from personal first, because I remember um, listening on a different podcast of yours that there was a point where you were doing a lot and there was a point where you actually had a breakdown um, doing a lot of different things and in, and the courage to, to move forward and really take this leap um, after all that, um, that says something. So I, I want you to dive a little bit more into that. Like what, what were those types of reflections that you were, dealing with and going through and what um, helped you pull this trigger in order to make this company of yours? I guess, man, where to start? <laughs> so, you know, I looked at this world through the lens of a dancer and early on, especially growing up with, uh, I guess like Asian parents, you know, uh, they're always looking at life in like what you can get back. So, is this job going to pay you well? Uh, is this very high status? Um, is there long-term career, longevity? Do you get benefits with this job? Things like that, right? And growing up as a dancer, you're like, nope, don't, don't meet that requirement. Nope, don't meet that. Uh, so I was like, man, yep. like, you know, I guess, the, I guess maybe dance isn't for me. How do I pivot that? And so... Next thing on the 
Asian families list is, oh, you could be a doctor. <laughs> so I was, it meets some of those requirements. And I was like, okay, maybe there's like some value in getting a, a medical based education. Um, you know, I, at the time, I, I really couldn't see myself committing to four years at medical school. Um, and so when going into athletic training, again, I had very little knowledge or background knowledge on what it was going to entail. Uh, basically, looking back at it now, it's a lot of hard work, um, abnormal work hours, but also just a dedication to your, your team your, your sport, your community. Um, it's really like the bedrock of it. And so in my experiences, uh, I was kind of always searching for that. Uh, but as a dancer, it's like, where, where is that for me? Right. And I would look at all the highest places that I felt were, were doing it right. Um, and even in that world, in that realm, dance medicine is still predominantly ballet and modern dance style based. There's a lot of uh, PTs and ATs and um, therapists working in that arena. When I look back into what was happening at our urban dance and hip hop community, breaking communities, um, one of the biggest things that I noticed early on in my dance career was how is it that I could leave the community for a couple of years and come back and things are still relatively the same uh, in terms of like how teams are running practices, what shows people are going to like, um, I wasn't seeing a lot of innovation and change that I was getting inspired with in all the other aspects and experience I, I was doing. Um, and, you know, one of the biggest personal moves for me was at the time I finished my master's degree, I had to make a decision whether to stay in Ohio where, you know, cost of living is great. <laughs> uh, come back to California and figure out how to start something fresh and new. And um, through that process, you know, everyone kept telling me, it's like, if you're going to, if you're going to do this, like you could take up to five years, uh, you know, you're not going to make any money. Uh, are you sure? Like you have to worry about the legal ramifications. Like, um, how are you going to market to them? They're, they don't have money to pay things like the list is endless about things that I guess like hip hop is known for, meaning that it's, it's just kind of like an underground street culture. There's really no beauty to it. And I'm like, nah, that's not true. Like, I think this could be really so something beautiful. Um, because I saw the parallels in what was happening, like, and, and I wanted to bring that to life. So at the time, um, leading up to, I guess, my quote unquote, emotional breakdown, it's just overwhelming stress and lack of lack of good management of it. Uh, it was because I was trying to do this on my own and take a lot of the things, this burden, this dream, the actions to do that, like all on my own. And uh, I didn't know how to work in the team quite yet i think at the time i was already doing some stuff with like dylan and you know we were and dylan can tell you this too um sometimes my dreams are bigger than my energy and capabilities and so i, I would you know i'll draft this like whole beautiful scheme of like we're gonna do two podcasts a month and we're gonna get the best speakers out here we're gonna write mm. these drafts through <laughs> social media we have a wet like just all this passion pouring out. And then Dylan just like looks at me. He's like, I'll do my best, but we're going to have to, you know, readjust some expectations. And um, it, it, that's been part of the learning curve um, is learning how to readjust the expectations, adjust the sales and making sure that if you're going to move that everyone is on board to move. Right. And um, yeah, it's been, I would say it's been tough personally, but I've also been blessed to be surrounded by amazing people that make it not so tough in a sense. Oh yeah, definitely. And that's something that um, was really compelling to hear in what you just said was that 
the I didn't I wasn't aware that and it makes sense right that one of the reasons why you ended up having that breakdown why you took a hit is because you were trying to bear everything on your own right have like trying to just do this whole big thing and just have this grand scheme as an individual but like I mean like Luis said on his podcast it takes a village right and mm-hmm. um it is also refreshing to hear that you started as somebody who didn't know how to work in the team quite yet because I mean um I definitely feel that personally first of all um as somebody who always feel like I wanted to do things um and whether or not people were down to do it like I, I'm just gonna try it on my own and you, you realize that there just aren't enough hours in the day to to, to do something extremely extravagant right on your own you need to have a team and I think what you've done today um, has is that and you said it yourself you built an extraordinary team and that takes um, that takes skill and it takes talent so I'm curious what you did in order to to begin let's let's start from how you started to put pull your team together and um, I wanted to hear from Dylan as well Um, I want to hear both your perspectives on what are the biggest lessons and um, things that have helped you mobilize the troops? And regardless of this being a mission that it might take five years to finally get paid or to make money or, or to get a return on your investment, um, what, how, do you, how do you compel people to, to move forward? Very good question. Dylan? No, uh, Aaron, you can take this one. <laughs> I'll, I'll, follow, I'll follow up. <laughs> All right. Well, to, as a preface, I don't know. I just want to say that I feel like you guys as a unit, when you are present at events, um, are there fully, which means that people look like they want to be there. They, you guys look official, you guys look together and your intent is, is obvious. It makes sense why you guys are here and everyone is on board to help. Um, and that's what, it, and I don't know how it is on the inside, but that's what it comes off and exudes as. So you guys, from an outside perspective, I just want to say that, you guys are doing a great job and that I, I feel you, like man. it's only building. So let's, let's, I just want to hear from you guys, you guys mouth is now like, why, why do you think that is? And how do you think it became that way? Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, I'll, I'll start a little bit and then I'll let Aaron go for it. Take it back because yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's weird, but it, I guess it goes with like, again, the first re-meeting of my Aaron and myself is like my willingness to just, eh, why the hell not? Why the hell not? Why, why should we, not put a foot forward why should we not take this risk just because some some people are saying nah maybe you might not span out but it was something that uh it was a dream it was aaron's dream as big as it could have been back in the back when we first like kind of drafted it all up i still believed in it enough to still continue to help him to this day because if i didn't want to help him i would not be helping him right now i would not be doing any of this especially because like i there logistically like it's taking a lot of time away from like myself for like bigger income elsewhere you know because software engineering and or software in general there's potential income for like you know six figures and all that but i'm taking time to step down from that to bring this this dream of aaron's up to something that could be more and maybe even longer lasting than a short career and like you know software engineering at this one tech company somewhere and yeah just my realization of that just like kind of like settled in more and more as I continue to work with Aaron and regardless of like, Oh, wait, what was the question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> so what, what made you want to choose well, okay, that so, path, right? Yeah, because yeah, that, it yeah, seems yeah, yeah. such, it seems so, it, it doesn't seem like the most obvious choice for everybody, right? Like it's so no. lucrative. Like I can yeah, be making course, like, so much money, yeah. but why? Yeah. Like, but yet you choose to decide to fuel this mission. And so I'm curious, what is your why uh, behind that? A lot of it also comes down from like the amount of, I guess, the foundation that my parents have like put for me as well, like both from a family stability standpoint, but also like financial stability standpoint. So I'm very blessed and very lucky to have something like that, to be able to make the choice to take time and then be able to, you know, help Aaron with this dream, regardless of like the outcome of it. And I guess that kind of going back to like, I guess the initial premise of the question was like, how do we exude such like, not only enthusiasm, but being consistent with wanting to be there with our mission of trying to help as many people as possible and not discriminating against anyone while doing so. And a lot of it comes down to the willingness that we're willing to put forth our effort 
knowing that this is a something that is definitely needed that maybe a lot of people don't realize it quite yet, but we're trying to change that narrative. And we, again, all of us on the team believe in the mission that we've put forth for ourselves and for the you know people in the community. So that's, that's the main reason why. Got it. Okay, cool. That's great to hear from the perspective of a teammate. And so now, Aaron, I want to, I guess, hear from your mouth. Like, what do you think it was? Um, because it doesn't simply happen that way, right? Like people mm-hmm. aren't just going to get behind an idea um, well, that's not true. Um, let me rephrase that. People will not be rallied behind um, so, a, a vessel, right? Unless they have the correct direction. And I'm curious, what helped you grow into um, and, and what, what, what resources or mentor figures or whether it be reflections or realizations did you have um, that have helped to develop your leadership skills? I appreciate you saying that. And there's a lot of different ways to tackle this. Um, so I guess I'll just provide like a brief overview and kind of how I s- answer the question of like what it takes to build a team and then kind of backtrack. Um, but, you know, one of it you already, ta- uh, you already addressed, which was um, having, uh, having a vision and having a dream and the leadership capability to guide people towards that two is making sure that everyone's intentions and character of who they are aligns with the mission of offset med and how they approach that the way they do that and then lastly is complete honest transparency so uh, I'll backtrack. And um, in terms of leadership, it, it always starts with the self. And by self, meaning that uh, if I knew that if I wanted to pursue this route of starting my own business, trying to, I guess, like create a movement, that I have to walk the walk. I need to go through the experiences, read the books talk to as many people as I feel like I can that have the qualities that I want to um, exemplify as a leader. So, you know, I went through a lot of changes and learning processes prior to even me meeting Dylan prior to this company being formed. Um, But this is the work that no one sees. They just see the product of it. And Honestly, it's pretty boring work. It's very mundane. It was me, um, I mean, in terms of like the organizational and how to lead on on a clinical and team basis. That was me when I spent two years in Ohio at a small performing arts clinic. But I got to work with an amazing leader uh, named Dr. Jeffrey Russell, who runs and owns the Shape Clinic out there. And he put me in positions where I had to, you know, mentor students. I had to treat a lot of patients. I had to act as a liaison between my team and other teams. I had to organize like international travel events and national events. How do I do that within a small team there? So I got to experiment that. Um, And it was a really good time to to see like, okay, during that time, what am I going to do? A lot of people could end up saying, you know, I'm working really hard. I'm doing school. Like, that's it. But for me, it was like, I wanted more. So I was listening to podcasts. I was reading books, um, always learning about like, what are the greatest, what are great leaders doing? What are they thinking about? How is their mind shift like, or how are their perspectives are like? Um, What do you think were some of those, um, like, top books or podcasts do you feel come to the top of your head when you're thinking about this type of leadership and and how to build that level yeah i mean i felt like at the time i was listening to a lot of like tim ferris i was listening to a lot of um tom bilyeu on impact theory um shoot there's it's it's riddled and every time i work out i'd like pick like a motivational 
YouTube video or podcast where they're just like, it's up, it's 5 a.m. in the morning. What are you going to do to, you know, like that's super dramatic, but you know, sometimes you have to like get lost in the story too. Like, you know, it's like every day I'm just going to, I'm going to try and be better than average. If I, if average is people waking up at 8 a.m., then I need to just be a little bit better and prove to myself, okay, I can, I can tolerate more discomfort than you. And I'll wake up at 7.30 even though it's like, you know, it just depends who your benchmark is. Yeah. But for me, it was like that. Where do you think uh, that desire to level up and be better came from? Like, what, um, what, where would you pinpoint that? Because I guess to give you an example, right? Like, it seems like not everyone wants that out of life, right? Not everyone wants to put themselves through this and like through the grinder to become a better person. And then um, it's often that dialogue, like, you don't have, it's okay if you don't want this, but if you do, then like you got to do this. But in order to want to do this, you have to find out why you want to do it in the first place. And um, I, I feel as I, I personally believe, and I, it's one of the missions of the crossroads is that I feel like any individual has the capability to, to unlock their best selves. Whether or not you don't want it, I feel like that if you're exposed um, or shown the possibilities of what you can do, then you're going to want it at some point, you know, you're going to want, you're, you're going to desire, you're going to dream. Everyone dreams. Right. So yeah. uh, for example, like, I feel like the things that awakened me when I was younger were like the best works of art, like in terms of like comics, right. And anime, anime was a huge one. Um, watching like Naruto and just these shows as a kid, like watching these things, like, like letting <laughs> me know that like, like you could be even Hokage. If, even if you suck, yeah. Even if you suck and you're the worst, no one likes you. Doesn't mean you can't grow into something better and bigger, and you know, just re reach for the stars, right? And just those types of inspiring stories, right? Talking about the importance of these stories. Um, that was what gave me the fuel in the fire. I think that still drives me today. Um, like watching, I always watch anime to to get me hyped up, and I don't know. I think just being exposed to it at a young age really set um, the groundwork for me to continue wanting to to have something better out of life and so i'm curious what those were for you all yeah. right uh for me i guess more recently and just kind of having more time to reflect on myself it's i can kind of see myself i've always thought like you know there you got to be kind of optimistic about the future to kind of like go up into it but in some perspectives at least for myself i'm very realistic in terms of expectations or realities dreams or things like that so uh, again that comes with the asian household you gotta survive make sure you're you're good before you do anything else but i can see that like for example being stagnant or like say in position in a life you you can go up you can go down or you can just stay the same and usually staying the same is you're constantly focused on like the benefits of just this one spot without really looking anywhere else and in other perspectives, you can see that you're not seeing the negatives of just being here constantly, you know? So at least for me, I recognize that for leveling up, I now, I know that like, if I'm here constantly, something's going to go wrong. Something, it can't be stable because like, I think as the par the movie Parasite taught us very well, plans, plans never go right. <laughs> if you have a plan, it's not going to work. Life's going to throw something at it and you'll never expect it to happen. So you're all, you always got to constantly change and, you know, come better and better to avoid, you know, the, you know, the hands of fate taking you, taking you for a ride where you don't want, you don't, ex where you least expect it to happen. If you're constantly just being or existing without any direction, you know, or if the direction is just straightforward, but nothing real different from that. So at least for me, you know, leveling up is being able to, I guess anticipates life to a certain degree, but not to the point where it's going to all come crashing down, but being, I guess, prepared for opportunity as well. Like I think one of a, um, a saying that kind of like stuck with me is when opportunity meets preparation, that's when like something crazy or something really cool can happen. Like right. for example, like those like we singers for love, or busk, right? busk, uh, people who busk or they're constantly dancing or they sing like just to be artists, for example, where I just put something out there, like they're always ready to do something 
And when the opportunity comes around, they're ready for it and they can take it and, you know, fly with it versus if you're constantly just chilling and the opportunity comes around, you know, will you be able to put forth to meet that expectation? Right. right. So you just got to do it. And like, that's, you know, for me, like, again, with it, there's a certain expectation too, that was kind of ingrained in me for a while. Whereas like over under, under promise over deliver, but that in certain perspectives, yes, that like helps a lot, but I feel like that just leaves more room to be, I guess, average rather than exceeding. You got to set the expectation a little high, just to like, you know, meet it to kind of like give yourself a kind of like a, I guess, difficulty spike. Like you're playing a game on easy mode. It's like, you know, it's not that fun, right? But you play a game on hard mode. It's that, that little challenge, like kind of like drives you to do better and to learn faster, to pick up faster. And that's what like allows you to deliver even more than what you were able to do if you were to give yourselves low expectations. Oh yeah, All right. definitely. Right. And <laughs> that's a really fascinating picture, right? Um, when you said that about the, how, um, life, if you, if you end up going stagnant, you actually end up going backwards. Right. Um, yeah. there, there's a, there's a short film that there's a YouTuber named Casey nice that, um, yeah, yeah. it's like, it's like 30 seconds long and he's on a, he's in an airport and there's this traveling conveyor belt. Right. Yeah. And he, um, he's, he's standing still on it and he's like, this is life. Like if you're standing still, you're actually moving backwards because life doesn't stop. Um, so you actually have to run. If you want to get ahead of life, you have to not only move at the same speed and keep up with the moving conveyor belt, but you have to, you have to run, you have to go and get it. Um, if that's what you want. And you you that's, that's a, that is an interesting concept. Yeah. And the idea that you said about the it thing and the under promise over deliver that kind of goes in hand with uh, when Aaron pitches you his great dreams and you're like, I don't know about that. And then you end up doing something probably pretty great because you under, you under promise, but you're like, you know, like, I'm just going to, I'm going to take this philosophy. I'm going to, I'm going to blow it up. So that's really, I'm um, always impressed. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That means Dylan's doing a good job. He's following his philosophies. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. For the Aaron, most part, <laughs> I want to hear from you, Aaron. What, what, what do you think were some of those things oh, man. that um, made you want more of life? I think I'm going to take a dark twisty turn for a hot Good. second. Um, you know, I guess mental wellness is a really big topic and I think it's always been a big topic for me. Uh, I just never had the words to articulate it elegantly um, other than sounding like a distraught teenager. Um, but I remember being early on, um, you know, just, in a car ride with family, um, sitting down quietly. And, uh, this was like when I was probably a dark time in my life. Uh, I mean, I say dark time in my life, but it's relative, you know, uh, for everyone, but I feel like everyone probably has this thought before. And the thought is if I passed away, what people say about me or what would I be remembered for? Right. And in that moment, I was like, I don't really know. Like, what what happens? Like, would they, what what would even change? It's about f- trying to find that that purpose, right? What is your purpose? And if you find your purpose, what impact are you going to make? And if you're if you're looking to make an impact, what type of legacy are you going to leave behind? And you know, I don't want legacy to think like, you know, you're like a whole kingdom visualization and you'll be in a textbook or something. Although that may be some people's uh, motivation. Um, for me, you know, having grown up in the dance community, I would, I would say like dance really saved my life. Um, it, it allowed me to have a way to express so many emotions to where like if I didn't, I'd probably have really – you know, poor family relationships, um, probably wouldn't be able to be as social as I am now, or see like the, that like effort breeds amazing outcomes, right? Um, So it taught me a lot of things I didn't know it taught me. Um, And eventually, it allowed me to finally start putting the puzzle pieces together, at least for my head, like, okay, what is the impact I want to leave on this world? I was given a a good family, uh, you know, a great education, 
Um, you know, I have a voice. I am healthy. Like this is when you look at it from a lens of like gratitude um, and gratefulness, it's like, shh, it'd be a waste if I just did nothing. Right. So that is kind of like that motivator. It's like, okay, what, where can I leverage my, my skills and talents and uh, share that and, and hopefully give people the same type of inspiration experience, something so that they can go on their own path and figure this life out. That's beautiful. I, I appreciate you going into that place, right? Um, because that is a question that I actually forgot about that I used to ask myself a lot. And it was actually very imperative in helping me find my drive um, when I lost mm -hmm. it is if I died today, like how would I be remembered? What would I be remembered by? And usually the answer to that, because I'm, I'm sure all of us have had, or I personally have had like a few like colleagues and friends who passed away like at my age and just like seeing that and I don't know just remembering like this could happen to us like it could it could happen like life is not guaranteed and it's short like uh, in the grand scheme of things in your textbooks there are probably and in just in history with billions of people going by and and like hundreds and thousands of years there's you can you can kind of the names that are remembered are very minute, minuscule compared to just how many people that have been around. And I mean, like you said, not everyone is trying to aim for that type of glory or recognition, but just remembering that scale and perspective really helps you, like motivates you in thinking, what am I gonna do like with, with this? And, and maybe not the entire world, but at least for the people around me, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I agree. And, and I'm not saying that, you know, wanting to matter means that you have to like chase fame, right? Like how you want to be remembered and all that stuff. You know, I, I'm saying that as in like, there, there is like a, a way you can be humble without making it bragging, right? There's a way that you can be of use and be of service to your people but also not, you know, just like blow that up into something that you're not, right? At the end of the day, we're, we're all just people. People trying to figure things out for ourselves and um, you know, everyone's on their own unique journey. And I think when you start feeding yourselves different narratives and things that like don't really align with your long-term pursuit of that and you know that's where i guess like mis miscommunication and altered perceptions kind of come in oh yes most definitely and yeah I, I think that that i think that's just an actionable point that people can take away um if they're trying to find something more out of life is i mean obviously like every person and um i mean i'll be the first to admit the the drive to want to be better it comes from fundamentally a more selfish place, right? When it first starts, you don't automatically think that oh, yeah. you want to serve the world. Like I, I remember reading yeah. that a lot when I was in college, like service is key. Like service is number one, like that's how you're going to get big. And I'm like, or that's how you're going to, to blossom and, and become your best self. And I was like, like service, like I can't even serve myself right now. Like I, I'm not even <laughs> at that level. So, so w where am I supposed to acquire this want to serve? And the more I thought about it, I was like, like, it's, it's, it's interesting because before you get to that level, right. It's like the idea of if you can help before you help others, you have to take care of yourself first. You have to take care of yourself. And, yeah. and once that fundament, and once that foundation has been more solidified, then that is when you start to realize what you have and the gratitude that um, you start to recognize around you. And that type of social cue and ambition that people have in themselves like as humans as social animals that is where the service begins to blossom at least for me personally so that's also a big point right i, I think um two two key things right that i've gained from your guys lessons is finding those answers within yourself first so that you are operational and ready to rock 
and then starting to ask yourself like what do i have to offer that can benefit people in in my circles right yeah, and yeah. so um i guess i want to ask you a little bit more about offset um particularly right so could you guys break down for me real quick just what exactly the mission statement of offset med is all right so offset med we are basically mobilizing an interdisciplinary team approach to urban athlete care recovery and education i mean a bunch of fancy words essentially we're just down for our community <laughs> to, to be honest you know we'll we'll help out in whatever way that we can leverage our skill sets strengths and talents whether that is um you know taking a, a look at maybe an injury you used to have and see how we can help you progress get better um to something as simple as like let's just teach you about some basic health things that we've acquired that we found beneficial um or now we're in a position where our platform is attracting other kind of professionals like myself and they want to learn stuff that like Dylan's doing. They're like, how do I start podcasts? Or uh, what are some of the, um, I guess, like technical considerations when I'm doing X, Y, Z? Or how do I take my information and market it better? Right? It's, it's like a niche that ended up feeding other people's curiosities. It's definitely true. And um, that's something I was really curious about as well, because you guys have this really interesting position um, between in, in like combining worlds, right? Like you got breaking and dance, and then you've got the medical world and like athletic training. And like you said, this doesn't really, this, this isn't very much a supply yet. So you're kind of that, you're in that position between the two worlds. And so I'm curious, how, how has that been for you? trying to communicate your message um, to these parties with, uh, you know, trying to communicate athletic training and, and, and physical therapy and all of this stuff to dancers and communicating dancers to like the, the, the whole world of dance and all of this um, stuff to your medical colleagues. Uh, I, I can kind of start and preface with uh, saying that, from a perspective of just an observer, because for me, I don't actually do any of the treatment because a lot of people, when I'm at the events and they see me in the office of measure, it's like, well, I can't treat you, but I can take a photo of you and like kind of document it because I'm mainly just, you know, the 3D tech guy, right? But when it comes to kind of seeing how, because I'll initially too, like I get introduced with like Aaron and the whole mission and all that, I was not quite sure exactly how to word what we're supposed to do what is offset med that's always been like the concerning question when initially forming everything and eventually at least within my perspective at least as you know b-boy dancer breaker not medical professional um like offset med we're providing an infrastructure for both education and also physical care for those who are able to you know get in contact with us and we can try to provide it as best we can and again the key thing is not only the infrastructure, but also trying to open source that education because we're not trying to like keep everything in under wraps and we're not trying to like hide our own little private practices and whatnot. Of course, you know, certain business details, that's, that's what it is. But as an overall, like overarching theme that we have, we're not trying to isolate anyone or isolate ourselves. We're trying to incorporate again for on Aaron's side, different professionals coming in, not just an AT or athletic trainer. We want physical therapists, occupational therapists, anyone who has knowledge that can benefit, you know, because everyone, once you get injured, you're kind of on the same page as every other injured person. No one's different. You get hurt, you get hurt. That's it. That's the bottom line. So when treating someone, you know, we, the more knowledge you can have or more perspectives you can have on that specific thing or specific injuries, the better, the more opportunity and the more, I guess, I guess what, what, when it comes to like nuances of injury, because no one gets injured the same way, it will be also beneficial for that. And uh, going from that to the perspective of like dance, it's very, from what I've seen at first, it's very hard to kind of like translate why they need it because we're so as like, you know, creatives, we're so focused on creating the art, but we don't really focus on anything beyond that, how to get there safely, optimally. Again, optimizing that movement, that's, that comes after we get injured, usually. So like, oh, crap, my shoulder 
got thrown out. How do I do this so that my shoulder doesn't get thrown out again? So instead of trying to like, because they don't, again, we don't think about it enough. There's never, there was never, I guess, a big overarching, like, I guess, thought in everyone's mind saying we need this. Whereas until someone from our team like brings it up to the dancers, like, oh shit, I actually need this, you know? So the, the need is there. We recognize that there is a need, but the people who need it don't recognize it yet. So that's why, like, again, education is priority right now, at least for us within the community to change that perspective. Again, perspective, being able to see that from our angle versus theirs. Right. All right, cool. So you got to touch on some of the uh, roadblocks that are kind of stopping us from trying to optimize the performance of an athlete and like um it's a little bit hard to communicate that at the current moment right and i can yeah. i can relate to that because as a breaker and being in the community the topic is rarely ever like yo like how do we, what are the best stretches that we can do to get this like no one ever asked that like because they they're too focused on the bigger like on, on that big goal right they're looking up and because i want that move yeah and for some reason that's like the <laughs> culture behind breaking right it's like just throw yourself and keep going like literally one of the most said pieces of advice for bringing is you need to swing harder. Like you need to, you just need to want it more, bro. Like I'm like, oh my God. like, okay. The, you the see those guys doing that. double air flares now. I'm like, advice. what? Yeah, exactly. But just that advice, um, it, it never really surrounded around, um, like individual operating parts of the body and, and how you can kind of best position yourself to take it on. So I'm curious, um, Aaron, like in your experience so far, uh like challenging these current um these current discourses right of of breaking in dance culture and how what have you guys been doing and what has worked so far to surmount this and start to spread the word properly yeah so as you know the culture itself is um it's got some deep roots right and us as outsiders and outsiders meaning that, you know, we, we aren't OGs, right? We're not in positions where we're teaching breaking to the new generation. Um, you know, I, I had the idea of creating Offset Med as uh, a hybrid uh, generation, meaning that enough time has passed to where you have people that have been in the culture, but instead of having the same contextual and socioeconomic background of how the culture was started, maybe they're able to obtain some education to give back and innovate that culture. So a lot of people that you'll see on our team have this background. And so we use that as like, as rapport, we use that as like street cred, you know, like we've been in your shoes. The next step, really is kind of just more of like, who would you rather talk to? Would you rather talk to your friend or would you rather talk to a stranger, right? Uh, most people are actually receive better critique and feedback from a friend than a stranger because they know they have their best interests at heart. So when we got started, we wanted to try and create that same feeling, which is why we approached this from a long game, meaning that we will show up to your events we will show up and be there from the beginning to the end because we know what you're going through you know it's not we're not one of those people that's going to be like you know we're going to be there for like two hours keep our stuff open and then we're going to peace out because you know we just have better things to do and we're here to say like no like you guys are the better things we need to do um, and whether you realize it or not we're just going to be a resource for you and we're going to reach out to you and we're going to try and and really learn and get to know you um and that's the whole point about building a community and building people that um as dylan said uh that's going to be part of your infrastructure because if you're if you're wanting to build greatness if you're wanting to build success if you're wanting to build skill or whatever like you need a strong foundation and we know that breaking is continuing of continue to evolve and we don't want this to i guess like get to a point where 
we are like missing amazing talent due to injury or performance errors or um, having the culture or people uh, of breaking or just dance in general misrepresented uh, because they couldn't get their level. They couldn't get their um, athleticism to a certain degree. I don't want that to be a barrier. Why is that even a barrier, right? You have, you have so you have access to so many people that can take this knowledge and education and like serve it to you on a plate, right? I want it to be that apparent so that we can start going through the next layer, right? I, I kind of think about it as like, some people may be familiar with like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And so what what is the breaking fundamental needs, right? So you, you need your body, but then, you know, I've, I talked with, um, I think I was talking with B-Boy Morris the other time and he's like, I, every move, every new set, every combination I do, I've already done it in my head. I just have to tell my body to do it. So how do we continue to elevate the sport and have people change and do crazy things if their body is the limiting factor, right? We're here for the artist. We're here for the athlete. And I think once people start understanding that, this is more of a spectrum rather than like you stay on this side, I'll stay on this side. Like this is a game changer. Oh yeah. Most definitely. What do you think are some things that we can start adopting and practicing as community members? Right. Because um, the way I see it, at least because you are guys, you guys are putting in your due time. Um, you guys are going to events and you're showing up and you're showing that you're there for us. And people are seeing that and recognizing it. Um, and slowly, you're starting to penetrate the discourse. But now, I think it's going to take um, not just you guys working on your own, but individual by individual, starting to understand what the importance of this is, right? Like, it's a priority. Um, like how, how can someone start, though? Because the, the reason why I think it's so hard to tackle is because it's, it's a big world. Like, there's a lot of information out there. And a lot of the stuff is very nuanced, like, um, like reading into it can be intimidating, but if you had to pinpoint like the priorities for breakers, where can we start to learn more about this stuff? And like, what, what is the, the, the barrier to entry? Um, where do you recommend that as, as breakers and as dancers, we start to look into that won't be so intimidating. I would say the easiest way that I can think of, and Dylan, you can correct me if I'm wrong or offer your own two cents for if you have like no resources like and you want to learn more about this just look at the people who have been breaking the longest and still have like high performance quality um what are they doing what have they done and when you look at it from that point it's not just about breaking right it's so many other things um and then you can kind of branch off from there i would say like the second thing is like health is health like, so if you get really good with your sleep habits, if you clean up your nutrition, if you drink more water and you continue to like, not just treat breaking as training and you start developing other movement, um, movement styles to like give your body a different type of stress you're going to be a more well-rounded performer. You're going to be a, a performer that's able to train harder because you recover faster. You're going to be able to create more and do more with your body because you feel more with your body and not just feel like you're stiff or in pain, right? These are all like internal barriers to like, um, that if you don't know any better, you're just going to kind of just mow through it and be like, well, this is it. You know, I know so many dancers that are just like pain is normal, which it is to some to degree. But if it's like so painful that it hurts even when you're dancing and it gets worse when you're dancing, that's not normal. Like that's such a hot and cold thing to go through where it's like dance is my life. But when I dance, I'm in pain. It's like, right. it's kind of been accepted as a thing that just happens, but it's not. Yeah. You can it's definitely normal, have yeah. dance sessions without pain. 
So but that goes through into like a whole nother topic. About, sure. I think this is a yeah. good place to, um, to segue because that was some great actionable advice for breakers. And um, we actually have a few questions from community members. Um, I think we're in two. Yeah, right now. So um, I, I'll pull them up. Well, first one from Izzy. <laughs> and Izzy. it's not much of a question. He's just saying, hope my boy Aaron's staying healthy. And I'm sure if he knew Dylan was coming on the podcast, he'd say the same to you. So shout out to Izzy. Oh, thanks, Two man. questions in a row, Izzy. Active member on the crossroads. Shout out to Izzy. Heck yeah. Um, yeah, he, he has a question to Don the other day too. Um, the others are spam, except for one other question that <laughs> Melissa adopts. Oh, Melissa. Yes. Oh, Melissa. What's up? She asks... What's the difference between dancing through the pain of pushing yourself and dancing through the pr- pain of overtraining? Often they both feel the same to me. And I feel like this is pretty relevant to what you were just talking about. So, wow. What are your thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, it was. I mean, Dylan, do you have any uh, perspectives on that? Like, Well, I feel like if you get hurt because through training and you try to push through that, that's definitely pain. It's very obviously pain, pain through like overtraining because like if you're injuring yourself in train with, how, how do we phrase this? When you train, like, of course there's going to be, you know, that the soreness, muscle soreness and fatigue that comes with, you know, training hard and trying to like improve the physique. But when you hurt yourself while doing that, that means you've kind of overdid it. Right. So that's the, that's the abnormal pain where you're no longer so just sore now there's a sharp pain somewhere in the knee or in a joint somewhere where it shouldn't be. And it's not normal stress. If you've, again, like when it comes to overdoing things, that's where the injury starts happening because you've overdone it. You're again, you want to push the boundary, right. To the point where you're not hurting yourself. But once you push past that, that's where like all the problems start happening when it comes to like physical health and physical injury. At least that's like my simple perspective on that. Yeah. Pretty, pretty good general advice. I know overtraining is a, is a tricky one because most of the time you don't even know what's happening. It's, it kind of just like creeps up on you. So um, in, I guess, like the medical world, we have things like called biomarkers. And they're basically things that you kind of track within your own biology that kind of tell you the status of like what's going on, right? Um, So in regards to like, you know, physical training and capacity, there's a couple indicators that, you know, I would start to frame my mind around, Um, you know, one of them is what we call RPE, which is called the rate of perceived exertion. How much effort and intensity do you feel like you're working at? Right. So uh, I'll go with a physical example. Say my goal is to, um, I don't know, get three air flares in a row, right? But during my training session, um, I'm working, I'm working, I'm working. And uh, it's been like an hour. And I'm just, just kind of drilling these things, right? You can get lost in it. And then you kind of have to like take a step back and be like, okay, like how exerted, how much fatigue do I feel? Is it like an eight out of 10? Is it a nine out of 10? Am I like 10 out of 10, like toast? right? I would say for the most part, your body's pretty good at giving you indicators of when you should stop. Um, Typically, it's going to start with kind of just like uh, just general soreness, right? Maybe at some point, if you kind of keep pushing the envelope, you'll start getting kind of like muscle spasms, kinks, tightness. Um, Maybe if you keep pushing through that, right? You're going to start getting some pain, a lot of discomfort, limited range of motion. Like these are all internal biomarkers that your body's saying, like, you're pushing me to the very limit. Now I have to like, go through physical biological processes to stop you. Right? Because the mind is so powerful. Like you could tell if your mind is up to the task, you can push through anything. Um, you know, another concept that is kind of beneficial to know is this idea of, um, I don't want to say body awareness because it sounds like very like, oh, you don't think I'm aware of my body? Um, but just like the uh, the idea of like, how do you 
are you keeping tabs on how how your body is feeling not only in the day not only in the session but in the week in the month right so um i'll I'll use this example so when i train and and create my own schedule uh i basically kind of look at it and be like where are like my highest days of effort and where are my lowest days of effort meaning that because i work um I also do training and maybe I'm doing like another project. So everyone's got a limited, you know, energy capacity. Right. And if I have, if I know I want to like train very often, not, I can't go ham 100% every single day because you're going to burn out fast. You're going to tank. You're going to miss a deadline. You're going to oversleep. You're going to like something's going to happen. Right. There's a cost. So understanding uh are you in control of your schedule and your body awareness in terms of energy capacity stress management uh, aka load management throughout the week throughout the month it's not perfect all the time but it's like the practice of it right knowing how like okay i've set up these conditions for me to push myself really hard and i've also set up these conditions for me to recover really fast So, you know, in training, we have this concept called recoverable stress, right? If I stress, it's like, say I'm trying to train heart rate, then I may just do a bunch of like, I, you know, there's different ways you can get your heart rate up, right? You could do a bunch of like power moves and then like your heart rate just skyrocketing, or you could like do a basic six step maneuver, change the tempo and intensity and have a timer and go for 20 minutes. I guarantee your heart rate's going to go up. Right. So, but those are two different types of burn. So understanding what type of stress and how long it takes you to like bounce back from that stress is just like body awareness. Then you're able to refine your own uh, ability to see like, I'm doing, I'm overdoing it or like, I think I can go more. I've got some more reps in reserve. Right. Right. So I guess it is a lot of just testing um, on the personal level because it's really hard. I noticed to measurably verbalize where you're at, right? Because Mm -hmm. every person is in their own body and like the pain and all these mental and physical, all these internal processes are not easily communicated, right? From person to person. So you've got to know yourself as well. Um, That's a big part of it. And I think what you said right there is going to be super helpful for people to start um, being mindful and gauging um, their levels. So thank you for that, both of you. And I guess to close up, because we've been going for a little bit, I appreciate you guys for your time, by the way. Uh, <laughs> thank you for having us on. Of course, mm-hmm. you guys. And um, I guess the second to last question that I have for you guys is just because this crossroads, the crossroads is all about taking what you have and trying to discover and awaken your best self, whether that be in medicine, in design, in art in business, right? Um, Finding these commonalities between us as individuals and trying to really tease out what is within us and how we can find that. Um, I'm curious to you guys, what, if if there were a driven college student um, in our community, whether that be dance or the urban world, and they were looking for indicators to help them discover their path and their voice, um, what advice would you give them? Whether that be a book or you can give them a book, you can give them a documentary, something that's, that's personally guided you. It could be anything, a quote. I guess I would say, um, and this is something I, I've learned actually recently, is test your assumptions. Um, meaning that, you know, if you don't know exactly what you're looking for yet, Ask yourself, what, why is that? Um, and do something in the physical world to test it just to see if it's true or not, right? If you know that, it, or say for me, like, oh, I wanted to, I'm thinking about pursuing physical therapy, but I don't like working with old people. Then that's an assumption I'm making about myself, 
And you're like, what do you mean? I thought you know yourself. And you're like, no. So guess what you have to do? You got to put yourself in scenarios where you're talking with older people. And what is it about it that unsettles you? And who knows, you may prove yourself right or wrong. And that can kind of help guide you towards uh, finding, a, finding what works for you. That's a good piece of advice. Because I think it's doing two things there. One, it's, um, it's pushing you out of your comfort zone, right? Because a lot of the things that we think we don't like are assumptions. And a lot of the things that we feel like we're afraid of and don't want to do aren't due to experience, but simply to assumption, right? So um, not only is it putting you there, but on top of that, it's, it's making you discover something new about yourself. And whether or not you end up liking it or not, you're going to find something new and you're going to know yourself a little bit better. So that's a good piece of advice. Thank you for that. What about you, Dylan? For me, it comes kind of, again, in the same realm of assumptions. And this comes within myself as well of like self-reflecting and seeing that I've been doing this for a while too, where I would kind of assume that I was like, ah, oh, that seems kind of difficult. Uh, maybe, maybe I can't do that. Or maybe I shouldn't do that just because it's kind of hard. But by the time I do something specifically like for my last job where it just learning about web development and redesigning some stuff for like an internal like company tool. I was like, Oh, it's not that bad. You know, like sometimes again, assumptions is what kind of assumptions are always bad, whether it be on yourself, something else, someone else, any assumptions don't make them. A lot of it just comes down to, you know, you just gotta try it and do it. If you can't do it, then, you know, you tried it. So you can't say that you, you, better to have tried it and failed than have you know constantly wish or think and internalize that like constant strife is like ah maybe i should have done this like years ago or something like that again back to that very trademarked saying you just gotta do it exactly and a lot of these yeah a lot of these assumptions that we make i think that idea is linked straight to the idea of resistance right not wanting to do the things that we should be doing because yeah. we often assume that it's just going to not go well for us. Or it's just When in reality, yeah, yeah. yeah, or it's just difficult, right? Like trying to learn software development. You're like, software development, like that's a whole beast. I'm not going to be right. able to do that. It's way too hard. It's also a reason why a lot of people don't want to get into breaking or other things, right? Is assuming yeah. that they're not going to be able to do that. People who type, I could never in the comments, probably have never yeah. tried either. So yeah. don't assume, right? Yeah, like you're, you got to just start. Um, Start, but and, it's also persistence following that too you can't just do it and say ah shit and stop right, <laughs> you, right, you gotta right, right. constantly do it it takes practice because again you know that trait the constant saying is like you know hard work beats talent right exactly so hard work yeah. is persistent talent eh, can persist but if you don't work on it you know you eventually lose it mm-hmm. right so on top of that yeah when, once you're in it then you're gonna have to continue pushing um, but if you're scared of just starting, often the thought of starting is much more intimidating than the yeah. act of starting and it's being that big mental scare. Line, right? Yeah, exactly. So there you go. That's, I think those are two very valuable pieces of advice. So, you know, Dylan, Aaron, thank you guys so much. It's been a pleasure. And, um, before we go, I, I wanted to, if you guys have any last words to share with the audience, um, whether that be something you're working on or a piece of advice that has helped you anything that you want to impart before we head out. Um, you, you can feel free to do that right now. Well, thank you, Kai, for, you know, having us on the show and having us share our perspectives. Um, I will say that, you know, given the unique circumstances everyone is in, um, we've got an easy way for anyone that wants to learn more, or connect with us um, to just kind of visit our website or Instagram. Um, we've got kind of, open class on Wednesday nights. Now every Wednesday night, uh, we'll have like one of our staff and kind of lead a learning seminar movement technique class. Um, that's kind of rooted in the fundamentals and, um, yeah, we're here for our community. So even if you have any questions, injury related, non-injury related, career related, not career related, life related, you know, we're really easy to get a hold of and, um, always down to kind of help build the new generation. If you want to follow Offset Med, go ahead and check them out on Instagram at offset.med. Yep. And yep. yeah, check out their programs, you guys. Um, they're offering all types of advice and might as well fill your day with some education and optimizing yourself. Aaron, Dylan, thank you so much. And I hope you guys have a good one. Stay safe.
stay indoors. And to everybody listening, thank you for tuning in. This is Kai, Aaron, and Dylan on the Crossroads, signing out. Yeah. Cool.